everyone, welcome to the first My Azo interview with uh, the amazing Chris Anderson. I'm sure you're all looking forward to hearing about his work and in particular one of his images. I'm so excited to introduce Chris to you. Chris, welcome. Hey, thanks Karen. It's really cool to be here for the first one of these. That's exciting. I know, I know. It's so good to just be able to kind of get in and find out more about your work. I know a lot about it, but I want other people to see the amazing detail that goes into what you create and um, find out a little bit more about even how you've been going with uh, awards in recent weeks. Uh, I've heard you've done pretty well. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, just to start, I'd, I'd love for you to share with people Share about your awards journey, share about your work, uh, and share about what's been happening for you this year. Cool. All right. So I guess my work first up, I'm a Brisbane-based commercial photographer and primarily in the area of performing arts. So I do a lot of uh, performer headshots, um, live theater, theater advertising, kind of getting back into some dance photography after a couple of years, which is really cool. Um, I've In the past, I've done everything and anything, but it's been really cool in the last few years to focus on the stuff that... It's kind of actually it's more like my own personal background as well. So it's a meshing of photography and stuff that I, I really like um, with awards. Um, I've been entering awards, I think, since 2012. Uh, and like everyone who's entered awards when you start, well, it may not go so well. So I think my first year was pretty heartbreaking and awful. But um, going through and, and like for me, the, the whole point about entering awards is you have to curate your work and that's a skill that needs to be developed and you need to make sure that you're presenting work that is just really, really top notch because judges are quite picky. And uh, that process of going through and iterating through your work and, and tidying it up and making it really strong makes you a better photographer and it makes your client work better. So uh, that's been easily the best benefit for me. Fantastic. Now, Chris, we are going to go through one of your images soon, and I just flashed that up on the screen so people can have a quick cool. glance, but we're, we're going to go through that in a little bit more detail. Um, but, but we do want to find out a little bit more about, too, not just uh, your awards work, but also how you do what you do. And uh, I can see that you're sitting in, uh, in your office uh, and that you've got some great gear sitting behind you there and I thought you could share a little bit about what you use um, and why it's so important to your workflow. Sure okay so this is my work workstation that you can see behind me um, and if I'm really fe feeling ever really low I can look at the wall and I go oh, okay cool I've done some okay stuff so that's helpful. Um, there are some important pieces on my desktop though um, I'm a I'm a PC and a Mac guy so uh, I kind of will use either. It doesn't really matter, but my workstation is a, a pretty beefy PC with tons of RAM because I do a lot of a million layers in Photoshop. You know all about that, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and uh, use a, a Wacom or Wacom tablet. Ah, so <laughs> it's always the question about how do we pronounce do these pronounce uh, brands? Yeah. And uh, of course, we're 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 talking about Azo. Where and that is Azo for anyone Azo. that's wondering. Azo like A to Z, Azo. Yes, so. that's right. That's right. It's always very very confusing. But uh, I've been told with uh, Wacom that it's Wacom in Australia. But I know that when I actually say that, people are like. Hmm? What's that? And uh, they, they, most people in Australia, I think, know it as Wacom. But uh, we'll pronounce it as we feel we want to, I suppose. I guess so. Um, <laughs> that's a huge part of my workflow. And I think it's one of those things that um, when you kind of switch from using a mouse or using a trackpad to using a tablet, it's a, it's a pretty traumatic switch at first. But once you make that transition, it's really hard to go back. And it's so natural to use a stylus. So I do all of my... Um, kind of retouching work or fine Photoshop work using that. Um, really important part, obviously, is the ASO on the on the desk. Um, <laughs> that's um, I, I found when I made again the transition from uh, previously I was working on an iMac, which is a beautiful screen and it's lovely and colorful and it's it's probably great for movies, but it's probably less great for making work that you can then translate into print because it's kind of trying to give you the the tastiest, sweetest version of the thing you're looking at. And what I want is a monitor that's going to show me, well, when I go to print, what's it going to look like? And mm -hmm. so um, a couple of years ago, I switched to having an ASO on the desk, and that made a really big difference. Um, and for me, a lot of my work is it's thematically and visually quite dark. So um, 
I tend to have a lot of shadow detail and that's uh, packing information in there sometimes. So that's a really important part. And that's one thing I found was a big difference with using the ASO was it gave me a lot more control over that. So did you find when you're, when you're using the ASO and particularly in those dark shadow areas, there were things that you could see on there that you couldn't see on oh, the eye? My goodness. Yeah. So the, um, the, the image that we're going to go through today, which is called senseless. Um, I actually, worked on that before I owned one of these. So I, you know, I'm working on it on my normal workstation. And then I went to a friend's house and used her Azo. And it's like, oh my gosh, there is all this. It was actually, there was detail in there that I couldn't see on the other screen that I could on this. It's like, oh, what am I doing? You know, so there's all <laughs> these things that really needed to be fixed. Um, and I guess what's that, what that has done is when I, if you are printing and then refining and then printing and refining, that cycle you do that so many more times if you can't see exactly what you're going to print. And I, I have a much better success rate now, and I kind of reduce um, errors and just kind of tighten that print cycle. Uh, so talking about printing, what do you actually use for printing your work? Uh, printing, I've got the Epson P906 there, which is brand spanking mm, new. Very nice, uh, very jealous. <laughs> only been in the country for a little while. Um, I had a P800 just prior to that, which is a beautiful printer. Uh, and uh, had it, you know, I could get it to do everything that I wanted to do, which is great. The P906 has a few things that are really nice. You don't have to swap ink tanks when you're changing paper stock mm. type, which is the best. Um, and it has a violet ink tank as well. Um, so it has a, you know, an extra color and it's, it, the blacks are a little bit deeper. I'm still going through the process of calibrating it and getting it going, but it feels like a, it's a, it's, I'm pretty happy to have that on the desk. That's for sure. And it has a little window so you can watch the print as it's coming and hope a little light on the inside to show you what's going on. It's very cool. Oh, very nice, very nice. I look forward to seeing those prints entered in some print awards at some any time that we actually awards. get. I know, yes. that'd be great, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the times we're in, most of the awards have been, well, I think all of them have been online, obviously, and, and that's quite different. But I know a lot of the time with uh, we've been judges, we've been judging together um, with NZIPP, and uh, we've been judging on our ASOs yep. to make sure that what we see on the screen is as close as possible to what someone would get on a print. So I guess yeah, that's absolutely. as close as we can get to the, the best of being a print award. Um, and you so, and I were often on the wrong end of the I know, scale when we were judging. What was that for? Very, very interesting that, that, you know, you might score high and I might score low or, or vice versa and then we'd see very, very different things. So it just goes to show that um, a, a storytelling image, an image that has a lot of depth to it, can really um, talk to people in, in very, very different ways. Uh, yep. And it's great that judging process in pe being a, people being able to share that. So yep. that, well, it is that a team was a sport, right? I mean, the, the point of doing that is to get the best outcome for the image and to... Um, Judges, we, we all do, and we should be working together to do that. It doesn't like we're arguing and stuff like that. Not you know, at all. It's, it's, not at it's all. about understanding the print as best we can. Completely. Or yeah. image, image, not print. Image, say, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of images, you work on a lot of your work. Uh, you do a lot of Photoshop work on it. Uh, some of your work is straight out of camera as well, but I know you do obviously do some work on that as well. Uh, how long would one of your Photoshop composites take you and what sort of time frame would you work on it for? Yeah, it depends on the piece. Um, so the um, composite or composite work, depending on which hemisphere I'm speaking to at the time. Um, it, <laughs> there are some where uh, it's really only a couple of days worth of work um, on and off. There are some that I've invested just weeks and weeks of my life in. And my cycle seems to be, uh, work for a couple of hours, park it, um, export my work that I've done, go away. And mm -hmm. then uh, maybe the next day I'll look at that um, export that I did and now start picking holes in it and say, okay, what's my game plan for the next time that I sit down? Especially if you're iterating through something where you've got kind of all the bones together, but mm -hmm. you're just kind of finessing it. That's a really um, important and very sometimes time consuming part of it is going back and iterating through to improve. Yeah, that's right. And do you spend a bit of time getting other people to look at your work or do you just continually look at your own work and then present it to the awards? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really big on feedback, actually. So I've got a uh, I'm I'm pleased that I've cultivated a trusted group of really picky friends because I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure most people are the same. You get really close to an image when you're working on it and you can't see it anymore. You know, you see the you, you see the stuff that your brain wants to see, but when you put it in front of someone else, 
The same way you put it in front of a judge, they're going to see things you didn't see. I would much rather have my picky friends pick holes in an award piece uh, before a judge gets to see it. You're one of those picky friends. So, you know, uh, Karen and I will swap work a lot and we scrawl all over it and and rip each other's work to shreds in, in a very caring way because it's better that we do it than someone else does it. Oh, absolutely. So I highly recommend that as well. Yeah, it's yep. just there's so many things that you've picked up on my in my work that I've had to go back and fix. And had I left it, then it would be the judges that would have picked up on it. And it's, you know, uh, yeah, you blinded to your own work sometimes. The tough part is you've got to find someone that yeah. you give permission to be really rough on you. Because when you talk to your family about this stuff, they go, oh, it's a great picture. You know, actually, my family's pretty rough on me about it. That's not true. Mine but, too. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> you've got to find people that... Um, that have the guts to tell you what they think and to give you some pretty raw feedback sometimes. Yeah, yeah, that's that's completely true. Now, a lot of your work, you also the commissioned pieces, uh, or you, you've you're actually a jack of all trades. You know, you, you've won categories from travel to you know Photoshop Illustrative and and anything in between. But uh, what sort of work do you do that is commissioned? And can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So the commissioned work that I do, the kind of the Photoshop style commissioned work is typically theater advertising. And um, really, they've got a lot in common with those awards pieces. And I, I'd say that I probably learned the skills that I needed to work on those commercial pieces from investing a lot of time in refining techniques and awards and things like that. But when you're working with theater companies, you're, you're really trying to it's like any advertising, right? You're trying to stop someone from flipping the page or scrolling past it. You want an eye-catching image that also tells the story of the show that someone's going to see and kind of represents it in a way that's effective. Mm. So um, it ends up quite often being a, a fantastical scene that couldn't possibly exist in reality to give. I mean, when you're watching a production, maybe your, your imagination is doing all that work. But um, when you're looking at an advertising piece, you've got to kind of do that work and put that in front of the viewer. So that's the commercial uh, commissioned mm -hmm. <laughs> commercial stuff that I would do. And how is that going right now? You know, we're in lockdown down in Melbourne. You're you're in Brisbane. Uh, is there it's any a, such work happening right yeah, now? Yeah, it's a bit better for us than it is for you at the moment. But it has slowed down. <laughs> like, I mean, um, there's because there aren't. We we went through a pretty long break where there weren't a lot of live productions, and you know, festivals had shut down and friends with production companies had really had to just put the brakes on everything. So uh, from my point of view, that work really slowed down. Um, live theater slowed down, headshots. It's not something that you, if people aren't actively looking for performance work, then the headshot's not so important for the moment. It's starting to pick up now, and there's a bit more live performance going on, which is great within um, certain restrictions. So it's pretty tough on theater companies, actually, who, um, you know, Maybe they're used to filling a theater that's this big, but they can only do a, a smaller theater now because of restrictions on, you know, how many you know, social distancing and that sort of thing. Yeah, true, true. Any creative thoughts for photographers out there that are looking to do work and just aren't finding it? Any ideas? Uh, that's a it's a tough one because they're all a lot of photographers are in the same boat and they're you're kind of all competing for the same work in a lot of ways. Um, I I found I kept myself busy if anything by working on an online store because you currently can't buy any of my work online um, and that's I kind of want to get there so I invested a bit of time in refining stuff to sell and then working with friends on a collective that should be up and running in the next couple of weeks actually uh, so that's that's where my time's gone. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, yeah, it's good to at least stay productive in some form. So working on our business while we can't work on anything else is a great way of doing it. Sure. Um, yeah, fantastic. I'd like to step into your image. It's called Senseless. I'm going to bring that up on screen now. And uh, I, I have loved this piece since um, before, you know, when the first time that I saw it and I love the communication in it and the story in it. And um, I'm really thrilled that you're able to step us through this. Now, to me, initially, uh, it looks like there's a lot of Photoshop work that may have gone into this, but I'm really intrigued to, to hear more about this piece and how it was actually constructed. So, okay, sure. Chris, can you run us through? Oh, and before you do that, uh, this piece, actually, I, I'd like to hear how it went in the uh, NZIPP <laughs> Awards and what might be on the horizon for you, potentially. All right. Well, some background. Um, the New Zealand uh, Professional Photography Awards, the IRIS Awards, uh, they were just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things they did for that awards was they allowed people to enter 
work. Um, normally work has a time frame, like the last two years is pretty typical. So they allowed you to enter older work and a, an unlimited amount of work. So it's like, okay, well, let's enter some old stuff that I haven't maybe put in front of a judge for a while, uh, which is really weird because you're checking to see if your old work is still competitive. Good news is this one was competitive. So this um, mm -hmm. got a gold award in New Zealand, which is excellent. Uh, it's it's very cool to go through that process and hear judges um, debating an image and talking about what they see. And, and you kind of hope that they see the message that you encoded in the picture to, to get across to people. So yeah, it got a gold, which is cool. Um, I'm really pleased to be a finalist for, I think it's called the uh, New Zealand International Photographer of the Year, uh, along with two other amazing photographers, um, Pharrell Yavari and Nathan Madigan, who are just mind-blowingly cool. So um, yeah, uh, best of luck to you guys. Um, that's decided on, or, uh, announced on Monday next week. Monday, yeah. So is, everyone can watch that, I, I believe. I think it's live streamed. Um, yeah. I think they'll be putting the links on the NZIPP page. So yeah, that should be a pretty good awards night, I think. It will. Well, all the best to you for that, Chris. I Thank hope you. you do really, really well. Uh, so let's get stuck into seeing the creation of this. If you can uh, share your screen for yeah, us cool. and um, let's t have you take us through it. So I'll probably start with um, kind of telling you where this image comes from. And um, hopefully it's not too hard to figure out the background of this, but um, just, okay, cool. So um, I found probably my experience as a parent isn't that different to a lot of other people's experience as a parent where um, you might, at the end of a long day, you just kind of collapse on the couch with your phone and do mindless, you know, scrolling through Facebook or reading the news or, or that sort of thing. Um, and in the meantime, my family's around and, you know, my wife and my kids and they're in the room with me and maybe they're having conversations about things, but I was kind of distant. Uh, and again, I think probably most people will go through a version of this, but I remember feeling pretty guilty about that. And usually when I feel guilty about something, the next thought is, oh, this would make a great photo if I can capture this somehow. So I really wanted to tell that story about um, in this case, a parent, but it could be anyone kind of getting sucked into the technology and, and maybe letting that take priority over the important stuff, which mm -hmm. is, um, in this case, it's family and watching your family grow up and, until, according to this story anyway, it's a little bit too late. So yeah, most, most of my um, kind of illustrative self-commissioned pieces come from how I feel about myself or what's going on in my life or my family's life or my friend's life. Um, and this one is no different. So kind of the process that I tend to go through, um, I'll often sketch um, to start and that's where the ideas start to come together. So when this was first put together, it was going to be kind of a two parter, um, same physical location, but sort of maybe the dad was out of phase with the rest of the family, uh, which is, that's not too bad. Um, kind of kept developing that, that idea. And again, sketching and, you know, by this stage, I found the location that I wanted to use so I could kind of sketch on top of it uh, and, you know, evaluate things like where he's sitting on the bench on this sketch. He's a little bit off center. And is that good or bad? You know, things that you once you've actually done the sheet, you kind of can't go back and fix so easily. So the more that you can get right up front, the better. Um, now, what I'm showing you now is is very close to straight out of camera. It's not exactly because there is some composite work to put pieces together, but um, this is essentially what was captured. Let me just uh, flick over to Photoshop and, um, all right, cool. So um, as you can see, there aren't too many layers in this, which is a little bit different to a lot of the Photoshop stuff that I do. But you know, for this one, uh, as is often the case, maybe you can't get all the subjects to do everything that you want all at the one time, so you're copying them together, uh, and then you know, really kind of removing some little tiny things that might be irking you in the composition, that kind of thing. But there really wasn't a ton of Photoshop work that would go into this. Um, lighting for this is pretty simple. I just basically had two speed lights in gridded soft boxes either side, so uh, changing their, uh, and this was shot during the day, they were just overpowering the sun. Um, and, and kind of changing the exposure as I shot to kind of change the mood as well. So yeah, from, I guess a, a lot of, I guess there's, there's two different ways you can do composite work. One is that you shoot um, a whole bunch of different pieces that are actually in different locations and you do some work to make sure that you've got lighting and perspective and distance and all that stuff, right? For this one, this is one of those composites where you lock the tripod, you lock the camera down on the tripod and it stays put. 
So you know, every everything that you shoot uh, ends up being kind of all aligned together, which makes it easy to bring one element in, take an element out, that sort of thing. Hmm. Chris, I just wanted to ask in regards to that, you know, um, a lot of people that start out in Photoshop compositing tend to try and shoot everything separately. And um, I just wanted to hear from you what your thoughts were on creating a great composite. And is it about the Photoshop skills or is there something else that they should be looking at? You know what? The Photoshop skills are, they're kind of in the basket along with your normal photography skills like good exposure and good composition. Um, they're really important because you're trying to um, hypnotize the viewer, but they're not as important as the story. So everything about all the choices that you make when you put an image like this together, they really should be in service of the story that you're trying to sell. So uh, if you've got elements that don't belong because they make the viewer spend a little bit of time on there, but they didn't really add to the story, then you should maybe consider removing them. You mm -hmm. kind of want, uh, there's a... Um, a photographer friend and she always says every element should pay the rent um, when you're when you're building something like this I think it's important that as a as an artist as a photographer the choices that you make are in support of the story that you're trying to tell uh, and so being in control of all of those choices is really important mm, very true very true so the, the Photoshop side of things is really to cast that spell and keep it going so if you have um, errors in your composite work so maybe the lighting's not quite right or the shadow's not right or you've you know got a little bit of uh, like a echoing of elements or, or something like that that sort of breaks that spell just for a, a little bit which is enough for someone to maybe move on to look at something else so for me it's about trying to continue that spell and and really walk someone through an image so in this one the composition is, is sort of designed for you to read top to bottom and and kind of Western um, culture, we read left to right, top to bottom. So you start at the top frame where it's all, you know, sunny and it's happy. And this it's happy family's time, with the exception of dad, who's probably should be paying more attention to his family. And then as time passes, it becomes darker and colder. And yes, that mimics what would happen in that environment if it, the sun goes down and it starts to rain. But it's also emotionally um, kind of what he's going through or what that family's going through. So you know, all that color and all that composition, again, needs to be in service of the story that you're trying to tell. Fantastic, yeah. Um, Chris, you, you touched on the importance of uh, the Photoshop, or sorry, the photography part of it there too. And I think just one thing maybe uh, that you're highlighting there too is that with lighting and perspective and everything like that, it's so much easier to get it right in camera if you can do more in camera. And that's that's exactly what you've done in this particular image. So yeah. keen to see more of this and, and how it's all uh, been put together. And and also touching on the, the painterly look, because we can see some uh, before mm. images that do, do look quite different to the end result. Yeah, so I think it, um, I mentioned this was a couple of years old and at that stage, uh, pretty much my painterly algorithm was to bump up the shadows and bring down the highlights mm -hmm. and then play with the color balance a little bit. Since then, um, I've started using more tools like um, Exposure. It used to be Alien Skin, but now it's just Exposure. Um, and Snap Art is one of the tools that comes in that package as well. Um, and so I'll use those sparingly. It's a, mm -hmm. they're, they're a bit like HDR. You can, you can get really excited and go overboard. Uh, and then uh, the next day when you look at what you've done, you realize that you probably put a little bit too much on. That's one of those things where if I'm doing work, I'll... I'll do something and then let it rest overnight uh, before posting it to social media because mm -hmm. in the morning that's when you realize, yeah, I went a bit hard on that technique and, and over the top. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, and your your painterly look, it's, it's not just, from where I can see it, it's not just those effects that you place over it, but it obviously is the lighting and the choice of lighting and the way that you photographed it as well. It's not just an effect at the end of it. Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, it's, it's pretty classic, um, classical art with the, the mm -hmm. one light source coming in. That keeps it very simple. And mm -hmm. and really, the the point of this is to draw your attention to the elements that you should be looking at. So I don't really want the viewer to spend more than a quarter of a second on the plants and the foliage mm -hmm. in the background. That's not important. You need to know that that's there to set the scene. But it's, it's not relevant to the story mm -hmm. that I'm trying to tell. So, you know, kind of when you compare that, which is 
close to straight out of camera to kind of that more painterly look really i mean there's there's some you can see that it's vignetted out on the outside a little bit and it's quite actually it's a pretty heavy vignette really but mm -hmm. it's it, the job is to draw you into the middle to the stuff that i want you to look at mm. Yeah, correct. So let's see so the progression of this and, and how it unfolds. Okay, cool. So um, you mean like the, the work in progress as it was the being work, built? Yeah. yeah, cool. I love your sketches, Chris. Oh. Uh, and there, there, there has there has been some comments there of people just loving your sketches. Uh, um, incredible that, sketches. You should sell them. <laughs> that just drives me crazy because they're like challenged four-year-old uh toddler sketches so if people like them that's great They're but brilliant. i mean they, i've got a software background and, and a lot of that um when you're building software you'll often build a prototype that you want to throw away and the, the purpose of that prototype is to find out what's going to be really difficult or problematic about the thing that you're about to do for real so you can make better choices when you do that um, and i find that translates really well to projects like this because you know there's a point where we we're on location and we've got the subjects that we're about to shoot and we have a finite amount of time mm -hmm. that when we discover mistakes afterwards, it's really hard to go back and, well, hey, everyone, let's go back on site. You know, I don't want to do that. I value people's time a little bit too much. So um, mm -hmm. I'd rather do as much as I can with prototypes like, you know, these sketches to try and uh, de-risk the shoot and make choices up front. And yeah. that's, that's a pretty common technique of mine, um, particularly if I'm doing something in Photoshop that is a little out of my comfort zone. I'll usually have a have a crack at that. And sometimes I'll um, get my family to sit for pieces. So they'll they're taking the place of the subjects temporarily anyway, so I can experiment. Yeah. yeah. So working through sketches um, mm -hmm. initially when this was being put together, I had it in my head that there would be a, when it was presented, there would be a big gap between the third and the fourth frame to try and suggest, okay, the passage of time. But that was a bit kind of visually awkward, so that didn't last, um, it didn't last too long. Um, let me go full screen, that's way better. So you can see as I go through, actually something I tend to do is I'll, I'll um, as quickly as I can, I'll try and figure out what that end look looks like. Um, and mm -hmm. then when I do my end of day export, I'll apply that look so that I'm refining composition and elements at the same time that I'm refining that look. and it should all kind of be, again, in service to that story that you're telling. So the more that you can de-risk it, the better. Um, so you can kind of see, made the choice to say, well, let's let's squeeze that bottom frame back up again. Um, and then another choice is in that second frame, that family that's that's coming out, it's, it's great and it tells the story. It's a little more crowded, but maybe that's not quite fully necessary. So kind of changing changing the crop and just changing that family so it's just the son and the mum's arm coming in makes it feel a little more desperate, mm -hmm. a little more sad, which hopefully reinforces the emotion that I'm trying to put into the viewer. And then continuing to iterate through, it's it's really just um, finding those little finicky things like um, you can see going back between and forth, back and forth between these two, changing the vignetting on the last one, changing the mum's, kind of the highlight in the mum's face, that sort of thing, um, changing the rain to make sure that it looks like what I want it to look like, um, checking shirts, like his his shirt's a little bit dark in that one, let's let's bring it up a little bit. Um, so when you go from back to the original <laughs> sketch, and the, essentially the finished product, they are fairly different, which is good. Um, it's it's fun to see how these things evolve as you go through the planning process. Yeah, it, it really, really is. I love seeing that progression. It looks like color is really very important to you as well and, and toning. And you can see a change in that progress, progression as well as you go through your images. And particularly as you get to the bottom, the, the deep deeper blues mm. and the more nighttime scene. Share a little bit more about that. Well, I mean, it's, it's exactly as you said, right? That, that emotion changes as you go through. The focus kind of comes in. You know, I, I want to give the feeling of time has passed and, and this guy hasn't even realized it. He's been so hypnotized by that. So, you know, it, it's, it's convenient for this story that night falling and that sadness leads to, you know, cold tones and that tells that story pretty well. Yeah, yeah, it really does, Chris. It's it's such a beautiful piece, and there's so much in it, and and it's the same with all of your other images as well, um, Chris. We've we've run 
into the end of this and and you know you've done so well sharing about your image and uh, i know there's been some amazing comments come up on screen about particularly the people loving your sketches and loving seeing your process if anyone has any questions uh you know we're right we're right at the end of the interview but i know chris would love to answer those and um, can also jump on later and and respond in comments yeah but, sure yeah, Chris, the, do you have any other suggestions to people that are maybe wanting to take this road or this style of imagery a little bit further, things that they can do to improve their work and, uh, and learn more? Yeah, so I guess job one is if you want to get started in it, this will sound really weird, but just get started. Find projects and do them because I learn by making mistakes and I make a lot of mistakes. So the more you can just do stuff like this. Um, I, it, I grew up doing theater, so... I had a willing um, set of people that wanted to have projects done. Um, so that's kind of how I learned, which is just jumping in with both feet um, and trial and error and experimentation. And then once you kind of start to find your feet, then I'd say start involving your peers. And you know, if you're in a community of, of photographers, you don't have to be a composite artist to give feedback on composite work. You kind of have to be a human who can look at things and, and read stories and stuff like that. So. Um, that'd be the other bit of advice is make sure you're engaging with your network of uh, photographer friends to get some feedback. Yeah, that, that's so true. You know, some of the best feedback that I've gotten on my own composites has been from people that don't necessarily composite because yep. they'll see something quite different, you know, and we get we can get really bogged down in the technicalities of shadows and lighting and, and yep. all of that, and they might see something very, very different. So I'll often say to people, what do you see in this? And you don't give any other information. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to give any background. Oh, on this day it was raining, so it was hard to shoot. You don't want any yeah. of that. You just want to ask them what they see in it and the yeah. stories that they come up with. Um, can really help to guide how you take your piece. Yeah, absolutely. Well, well, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure interviewing you and, and hearing all about this. I know everyone's loved uh, hearing your story. So thank you so much. All the best for Monday night uh, Thanks, for International Photographer of the Year. Woohoo! You've, you've <laughs> done incredibly well to get uh, look, even to finalist. Finalist <laughs> is like I'm stoked and those other two are just insanely good. So I'm, I'm happy to be in that group of three. That's enough. So it's Incredible. Yeah. Cool. There's, there's, there is one other question that's um, popped in here that uh, I, I think is for both of us because uh, the question is are you going to be able to do something for the children this Christmas and you've been a big part of the Heart Project and the Christmas Wish uh, up in Queensland and we are quite devastated with the, the pandemic and what's happening. It's really limiting a whole lot of things. But just to let you know, Robin and anyone else, there are still there is still a way and there's always a way to help families in need. And yes, it might be very much more online this year, but we do still plan to do something. And I know Chris will be involved in that as well. Yep. So yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to help families that are going through a rough patch. So thank you so much, Chris. And uh, I'll say, we'll say farewell. We'll say All goodbye. Right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Karen. Bye.